Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here this morning. It's good to see all of you. Very happy to see every, each and every one of you. Uh, welcome to Fellowship. My name is Jacob Chamberlain. For those of you I might not know, I am still the pastor in training of our South Campus. Maybe one of these days I'll get a uh, promotion. I don't know. We'll see. But anyways, we are continuing our series called Matchless, looking how Jesus is superior to every other person, to every other system, to every other everything. And so we are in the Christmas season right now, right? Thanksgiving is past. How many people have their trees up already and decorated? Yeah, not many of us. I'm one of them. We put it up, it was, which is unusual. Sometimes we don't even get a tree. I've, the holiday spirit just seems to pass me by sometimes and I just get caught up and we don't do it. Ours is up and it was decorated by Thanksgiving. It's just, I think we just want to cling to some kind of normal. We just want some kind of normal thing to cling to and so we put ours up early. But anyways, the seasons are changing. Thanksgiving is past. It is now Christmas. We see Christmas lights. We see Christmas trees up. And we also see the advertisers on TV doing their best attempt to separate you from your money. And we see these commercials where they are assuring you, that they are telling you that you need their product. Not only do you need their product, but you deserve their product. You really deserve it. You've had a hard year. You deserve to buy what they're selling. You need to get the best deal. You need to be out there shopping, in line, get the best deal. You need to have the exact perfect present for your family member. And you better hurry because supplies are limited and they're almost out. And if we are not careful, we can get caught up in this. I find myself getting caught up in this. Year after year, I have to fight against this. If we're not careful, we will get caught up in this. We'll, we'll find anxiety and we'll find stress. And we'll find the joy of Christmas sucked right out of our lives as we give in to what our culture is telling us. All, our culture has convinced us, unfortunately, that the way that we show love for people is by how much money we spend on them. Right? Maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars. And the more many money that you spend for people, the more that you care and the more you love those people. But not surprisingly, Scripture says something completely different. Paul says in the second chapter of the book of Philippians, where we're going to be today, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. He's going to show us today that the way that we show love for people and affection towards people and unity with God's people is actually through a strange way. And I'm going to tell you what it is right up front. It's through humility. The way that we show love for people, the way that we have affection towards people, and the way that we stand in unity with people is actually through humility. So a little background. So in the book of Acts, we read that Paul was sent to Philippi by the Spirit. He was sent by the Spirit of God. And so him and his colleagues went to Philippi. While Paul was there, God did some amazing things. He did some wonders. And because of that, the church at Philippi was established. It was set up, it was born, it was birthed. So now, fast forward, Paul is now in prison. And he's not in prison because of anything that he's done. He's in prison for sharing the gospel. He's in prison for being a Christian. And he's sitting in prison, and what is he doing? He's writing a letter of encouragement to the Philippian church. He's writing to his brothers and sisters. He's writing to his friends, and he wants to encourage them. And for the most part, the letter itself is full of joy and gratitude for what God is doing in their lives. Right? There's a lot of good things on going on. But there's also a note of seriousness in the book of Philippians. And the reason there's a note of seriousness in the book of Philippians is because these people were facing challenges. They were facing challenges from without. They were facing persecution. They were facing challenges from within because there was false teachers teaching false things. And then on top of all that, there was conflict between the believers. There was conflict in the congregation. And it's this last thing, this conflict between the congregation that was the most dangerous. And the reason it was the most dangerous is because if we are not united as a body, as brothers and sisters, guess what? The persecution from outside comes in and it hurts us and it affects us if we don't stand united as a body, as believers. A house divided against itself cannot stand. It will fall. And also, it ruins our witness. If we are not united as a body of believers, what kind of draw? What kind of, is that attractive to the world at all? No, they get plenty of that in the world. So it's dangerous. So in the first chapter, we're going to be in chapter 2, but in the first chapter of the book of Philippians, Paul takes some time to, to lay out unity for them. He lays out the importance of unity among the believers to them. And he says clearly, he says, they are partners with him in the gospel. He says, you guys are my partners. Hey, we are on the same team. All of us, we are on the same team. We are partners in the gospel. He tells them that we are partakers of God's grace. 
right? We are all indebted to God. We are all in this together. Not only are we on the same team, but we have the same motivator, and it's God's grace, so we, God's grace, and so we are in his debt. Then he goes further, and he gives him an example of unity. Paul is sitting in prison, and he says, you know what? My punishment, the fact that I'm here, has actually emboldened other Christians to go out and be bold in their witness and to share the gospel, and for that I'm thankful. He demonstrates unity, by his actions, by his thoughts, by the way he looks at things. Yeah, I'm in prison, but you know what? It's helping other believers. That's how united with other believers he was. And it doesn't stop there. He's united with them also. He says, you know what? I would rather die. He says this right in the first chapter. I would rather die and go to be with Christ. This would be so much better than the life I'm living. But he says, you know what? I know for a fact it's better that I'm here. It's better for your sake that I'm here and for that I glorify the Lord, even if that means suffering for me. That's what he tells them. That's how important unity is for them. And he lays it out in the first chapter. And then right at the end of the first chapter, this is what he says. He says, because of these things, this is what I want to hear about the church in Philippi. This is what he's, I want to hear that you guys are standing firm in one spirit. I want to hear that you're standing firm in one mind. I want to hear, I want to hear that you guys are standing side by side, striving for the gospel. And so the question that raises in my mind is why are they to do that? Why? What's the purpose of that? What's, well, we talked about two of those. Let me remind you what those were. The first reason is attacks from outside, persecution from outside can affect the body that is not united, right? Gossip, rumors, divisions come in and they start separating people. So that's one reason. Another reason is it destroys our witness. If we are not united as a body of believers, our witness to the world is destroyed. If they can't get along and they're God's people, you know, why do I need that? But the other reason the other reason that we need to be united as a body of believers we find in verse 11 of chapter 1. This is what it says. It says, so that we will be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That is the important part to the glory and praise of God. The Philippian church and we also as a body of believers, the reason we are here is to glorify God, to bring praise to the name of God of the Lord. And the one way that we do this, one way we can do this, is by being united in mind as a body of believers. To be united, we need to have a common goal. We got to have a common focus. If you're worried about you and you're worried about you and I'm worried about me and no one's thinking about each other, we're divided. We are not thinking about each other. So what's the answer to that? If we are all concerned not only with our own interests, but also the interests of others, all of a sudden, now we can stay united because we have a common goal, we have a fo common focus. That common focus and goal is others. It is others. As we look to lift them up and support them and help them. The world is selfish enough. We don't need to find selfishness in the church as well. And we have a picture of what that, that's going to look like. We're going to be in chapter 2, and Paul gives us a picture of what that's going to look like in verses 1 through 4. Before we jump in there, let me pray for us real quick. Fathers, we come to your word. I pray that we would be humbled as we look at Jesus Christ. We look at who he is and who we are in light of who he was, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would open the scriptures, Lord. I pray that you would open our minds. I pray that you would give us understanding, Lord, in your mercy, that you would fill this place with your spirit, Lord, that you would speak to each and every one of us, Lord, through your word about the glory and the beauty of and the majesty and the praise that Jesus Christ deserves for who he is and what he's done, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So right here in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 2, we get a picture of what that's going to look like. Let me read them for you. He says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, basically he's saying if you've gotten anything at all out of a relationship with Christ, if you've gotten anything at all, if you've gotten any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Okay, so there it is. We're to be united with each other to bring glory to the Lord. 
How on the earth are we supposed to do that? How in the world are we supposed to do that? Have you ever tried to be united with other people? It is almost impossible. The more you get to know people, the more time you spend with them, the more you realize you're not like me at all. You think of things totally different. And that's, that could be a good thing. That could be a great thing. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to just grab a hold of ourselves and talk ourselves into it and give ourselves a good pep talk and say, you could do it and just by sheer resolve and will determine that we're going to be united with believers? No. That's not the way the Lord works. Thankfully, we have some outside help. And there's two ways that we are to do this. There are two ways that we're to be united with other believers, loving and affectionate towards them. We see those two ways in verses 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. So what's the first way that we are to be united and affectionate and loving towards one another? We are to look to Christ and we are to remember his example of humility. In order to be united with other believers, we need to start, we don't need to love people more, we need to start with humility. Humility is actually showing love. So what is humility? I think we all know what it isn't. I think we all know it when we see it. We, we, we know what humility is not. When we see it in ourselves, when we see it in others, we say, that person is not humble at all. I heard a story about a pastor who, who his church gave him a medal. They gave him a medal, said the most, the most humble pastor in all of America. And the next Sunday when he wore it to church, they took it away from him. You know, we know what humility is, what lack of humility is. We know it when we see it. But what is humility? Well, we get a beautiful picture of what humility is through the life of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to take some time. We're going to look at some different aspects of Jesus' life to paint a picture, a beautiful picture of what humility, more humility than you and I are ever capable of, actually looks like. The first thing we see is right here in this passage, verses 6 and 7. This is what it says. Jesus' willingness to become a human being. Just Jesus' willingness to humble himself. God of very God humbled himself, put on flesh, and became a human being. Look at verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So Jesus, as the second member of the Trinity, always existed as God. But he did not consider his own interests over the interests of those that he would come to save. He laid down that advantage. He took the form of a servant. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. This is an interesting phrase. Have you ever considered this? He emptied by taking. Jesus Christ emptied himself by taking. This is what some theologians call subtraction by, addic by addition. They call it subtraction by addition. Jesus subtracted from himself by adding to himself. Let me try to paint this with an illustration. Imagine somewhere out in the country, there is a big piece of land, a couple hundred acres, and on that piece of land, in the middle of that land, someone has built a beautiful, gorgeous house. They have spared no expense. The roof of this 5,000 square foot home is individual copper shingles. The walls are granite and marble outside. There are pillars that are intricately carved by hand, each one original in design. Throughout the house, all throughout the house, there's two-inch teak wood for flooring. The walls are covered with cypress or cedars of Lebanon. Every wall paneled with cedars of Lebanon. Every fixture, every faucet, all the fixtures are all gold-plated, every one of them. Outside, the landscaping is immaculate. Every tree is perfectly placed. It's the perfect size. It's just the perfect yard. The grass is like a lush green carpet. Now imagine someone comes across, across this beautiful home that anybody would be proud and happy to own and live in, and they decide they want to add their own flavor. They want to add their own personality to this home. So they take, go outside and they scuff up the granite, and they scuff up the uh, marble, they paint it hot pink. The house is just a beautiful hot pink now. Inside they go and they lay linoleum on their beautiful teak floors. They glue linoleum down. Over the cedar walls they put up some nice wallpaper over their, the nice cedar walls. Outside and then inside 
they leave the doors and windows open just to let a breeze in, but they're open all the time. Moisture and animals come and make their home in the, in the home. Outside, they park their cars in the yard. They change their oil right there on the grass. They dump their oil around the trees. They have done nothing but added to this house. They've taken nothing away. They've only added. But in adding to it, they've actually subtracted from the home. Now, this is not a perfect picture because Jesus is never, ever less in value, ever. But you get an idea of what subtraction by addition looks like. He limited himself. He took the form of a servant and he humbled himself and came to this earth. That's how humble our Lord is. That's how humble our God is. Another way that we see Jesus' humility is, is, is through this, but these things were predicted in the Old Testament. Jesus was said, it was said that Jesus would come as a suffering servant despised and rejected by men. Yes, we're told in the Old Testament that Jesus would come as a king, but what kind of king? A king, king who came humble and lowly, riding on a war horse? No, riding on a donkey, the lowliest of animals. He didn't come with pomp and circumstance. He came riding on a donkey. And in Zechariah, we're told that Jesus' coming would be the shepherd who was struck, the shepherd who would be struck down. We talked about this last week. Jesus was also born into a poor family. Do you remember when Jesus' parents, when Jesus was a, a baby, they took him to the temple to fulfill, to satisfy the God's laws about a firstborn son. They took him to the, to the temple. And what did they bring as an offering? They brought birds. Who brought birds as an offering? The poorest of the poor. If you couldn't afford a, afford a bigger animal, it was kind of a way of, hey, just bring some birds. If you can't afford a bigger animal, just bring birds. So his family was very, very poor. They brought animals, they brought birds as a sacrifice to fulfill God's law. And Jesus humbly obeyed these parents throughout his entire life. You remember when Jesus was 12 years old and they took that trip to Jerusalem to go to the Passover feast? And after the feast, his parents left. And they were with a big company. They were with family, it seems. And so after a day's travel, they realized, hey, where's Jesus? He's not with us. So they go back into the town. They're looking for him. They're looking for him. For three days, they look for him. They finally find him in the temple having conversation with the teachers, asking them questions, answering questions. He's 12 years old. His parents are very upset. They demand that he come back home with them. And what does Jesus do? He humbly submits. It says he comes home and he was submissive to them. Jesus Christ, through whom all things are created, by whom all things are created, and for whom all things are created, submitted humbly to his parents. Jesus also obeyed his father all the time. He says, I only do those things that please the father. I only do those things that are the father's will. He always kept the father's will perfectly. And one of those things that he did, keeping the father's will perfectly in humility, was he was baptized. You ever thought, why, in our, why on earth did Jesus need to be baptized? He didn't need to be baptized for his own sin, but it was so that all righteousness could be fulfilled. In that way, he was obedient to his father and he joined fallen humanity in being baptized for sins he never committed. He wasn't baptized for sins, but he was baptized in obedience by John the Baptist. While he was on this earth, Jesus accepted unfair treatment, more unfair treatment than anybody ever. It says, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Jesus was spit on. He was hit in the face. His beard was ripped out. I can't imagine what that felt like. And he sat there and took it all. Do you not think that he could have retaliated? He says, clearly, I could have called legions of angels and in a heartbeat, they would have come and rescued him, right? He had that ability. He had that authority. He had that power, but he limited himself. He did not use it. Jesus, this is, Jesus's life, the picture of Jesus, it's not weakness disguised as humility. This is humility. He could have gotten himself out of this situation easily, but he didn't. He humbled, humbled himself to the will of his father. And while he was on this earth, he had a servant's attitude. Remember what he told his disciples? He said, look at the Gentiles. Look how the, those ones in authority, they lord it over people. They say, look at me and my authority. They're proud of their authority. They make sure everyone knows it. Jesus says, I don't want you to be like that. He says, the one who's going to be greatest among you, I want him to be the biggest servant of all. The one who's going to be the most important, I want to be the biggest slave out of everybody. And he said, I want you to follow me in my example. He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. You talk about humble. Jesus taught about humility all throughout his, his whole ministry. 
How many times do we remember Jesus saying, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted? He didn't just say it. Jesus Christ lived this out. Do you remember the the example he gave of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector both going to the temple to pray before the Lord? This is how he taught about humility. The Pharisee was all proud, proudly looking up to heaven, loudly praying, oh, I thank you, I'm not like this tax collector. And what did the tax collector do? He wouldn't even look up to heaven. He looked down and he beat on his chest because he was so broken over his sin. And he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus taught that this man went away justified. This man went away forgiven because of his humility. Jesus taught about humility throughout his whole ministry. Not only did he teach about it, he modeled it. And one of the most shocking examples of Jesus modeling humility is this. On the night he was crucified at the Last Supper, the night before he was crucified at the Last Supper, he went around the table, he took off his outer garment, he got a pail of water, he knelt down and washed his disciples' feet. And not only did he wash his disciples' feet, he washed Judas' feet. The very man who would betray him soon. He washed the very feet that would bring the soldier to arrest him. You talk about humility. Not only did he show humility with Judas, what about all the people around him? People loved to be around him. The outcasts loved to be around him. Children loved to be around him. Do you remember when the children ran up, parents were bringing children to Jesus Christ, and the disciples were like, hey, get back. You know, at that time, children weren't seen as very important. And what did Jesus say? He said, no, 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 no. He said, let those children come to me. He picked them up in his arms and blessed them. That's our Lord. And what about beggars who were kind of shunned and kind of people went, went around them so they wouldn't have to give them money? Remember the two blind beggars sitting by the road when Jesus walked by? They cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and he said, what do you want me to do for you? He said, let us receive our sight. And he healed them. He stopped. These two beggars and healed them. You talk about humble. What about lepers? What about the lepers, the outcasts of society? They weren't even allowed to live with everybody. They had to live out in their own colony. Then they had to wear ragged clothing. They had to cover their mouths as they walked through crowds of people. They had to yell unclean so everyone would part and get away from you. You talk about isolating and embarrassing and awkward and not wanting to be. What did Jesus do? He touched these people. He touched these lepers and healed them. That is our humble Lord. That is our humble example. We are to follow the example of Christ's humility. What about the biggest one? Jesus accepted the cross. Jesus humbly accepted the cross. Let's not be so comfortable. I think there's a danger. We get so comfortable with the cross that we sometimes forget the pain, the torment, the agony, the shame of it all. And not only all all that, those things, add to that the fact that Jesus lived his whole life knowing what was coming. He lived his whole life knowing the cross was coming. You talk about mental anxiety your whole life, knowing what's coming, knowing where you're going. Think about COVID right now. That's part of the stress people feel about COVID. So, you know, you just, you don't know, you, what's the big question everybody has? I just want to know how it's going to affect me. How is my body going to react? You know, I just want to get it over with, especially if someone in your house has it. Just that mental anxiety. And that's for a short period of time we've been dealing with this. Jesus dealt with these things for his whole life. He lived his whole life with the knowledge, not that he he might be crucified, it was certain. He never had the question in his mind, might I survive this? No, he knew he would absolutely not survive this. And not only all that, he knew for a time he would be separated from his father, whom he loved, who he had never been separated from before. And our Lord, your God, my God, humbly accepted it all. So, beautiful picture of humility in the life of our Lord. What is the first way we're to be united with other believers? Standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, standing shoulder to shoulder, striving for the faith of the gospel. Humility. Humility. It sounds easy enough, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, you know what? I want to do that. I can do that. I'm going I'm to be more humble. I'm just going to be more humble. And it sounds easy enough, and we do pretty good while things are going good. But wait till you're standing in line at the grocery store, a long line, and someone whoop, just cuts in front of you. Or wait until you're waiting to turn into a parking spot with your blinker on and someone whoop, pulls right in front of you as you waited for them to pass. And all of a sudden you see yourself in truth and you see how humble you are not. 
That's why it's so important that we are doing what we are doing right now. We are stopping, we are taking time, we are looking at Jesus, seeing humility displayed, seeing humility modeled, remembering it. This isn't humility in theory, this is humility in reality. And more, like I said, than any of us in this room are capable of. So the first thing that we need to be, to remain united with other believers is humility. There's one more thing we need. The second thing that we need is we need the mind of Christ. We need to have the very mind of Christ. Now, thankfully, we are not left to our own, our own devices to try to get a hold of ourselves and try to talk ourselves into it and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and give ourselves a good pep talk and do it. No, we are told right here in Scripture that we have the mind of Christ. It says right here in verse 5, oh, my fault. I did it. Verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It sounds to me like it's up for the taking. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Not only do we have Jesus' life as an example for us, but when you became a Christian, you had to humble yourself. If you are here today and if you are a true Christian, there was a point in your life where you had to humble yourself. You had to bow before your Father in heaven and you had to confess your sins. You had to admit your guilt. So now, guess what? Now you know what humility feels like for at least once in your life, hopefully not once, hopefully it's been every day of your life, but at least one time in your life, you now know what humility feels like. And when we do that, when we bow before our Lord in heaven, when we repent, guess what happens? We discover a surprising truth about the world and the way that our God works in it. See, with our Lord, he turns things on, his head, on, on its head many, many times. Many times in Scripture, we're left scratching our head going, that doesn't make sense. And the person who reads it, who isn't a Christian, who doesn't have the Spirit living in them, reads that and says, it doesn't make sense. You guys are crazy. It doesn't make sense. Before I was Christian, none of these things made sense. Tell me if this makes sense in a natural world. If you want to live, you must die. What did Jesus say? Jesus say, whoever would save his life Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What? That doesn't seem to make sense. God turns things on their head. The world tells you that seeing is believing. What does God say? You believe and you'll see. Doesn't make sense. We're told clearly that God's power is made perfect in what? Weakness. God's perfect power is made perfect in weakness. Again, doesn't make sense. God uses what to shame the wise? The foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Huh? I mean, thankfully, he does that because, you know, that's why I do what I do. But that's the way God works. Jesus said what? Blessed are the poor in spirit. That goes against everything in us. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. These things don't seem to make sense. What about this one? The meek shall inherit the earth. Not the strong, not the mighty, not the powerful, not the rich. No, no, no. The meek shall inherit the earth. I have this good friend, Jerry. I haven't seen him for years, but we used to get in lots of trouble together. And Jerry and I, one time we actually got arrested on the same crime. We were actually in county jail at the same time for the same crime. And we had, anyways, we were just hanging out there. But we had this, mentali we had this mentality in there. We had this mentality between ourselves that the worst thing you can be as a criminal is a rat. That is the absolute worst thing you can be as a rat. And that means you tell them people, you do not do that. And so Jerry, being Jerry the way that he was, he would take this verse. We both knew scripture, but we were both in rebellion. He would take this verse, the meek shall inherit the earth, and he would make it say this, the rats shall inherit the earth, and the rats shall inherit the earth. And what he was saying there, what he was implying, what he was suggesting was that meekness is somehow weakness and something to be looked down upon. That is the attitude of the world. Meekness is weakness. And that's something to be despised. That's something to be looked down upon. But Christians, as Christians, we have discovered something. We have discovered that with God, the way up is down. If we want to be in heaven, we need to bow before the Lord. And guess what happens when we do that? When we bow before the Lord in confession, he gives us his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of us. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, if you love me and you keep my word, me and my father will come and we will make our home with you. 
Guess what that means? That means we're the temple of the living God. And in this way, we have the mind of Christ. So there's no excuse. We have an example here. We have Jesus, the model of humility to look to, the perfect example of humility. And as Christians, we now have the mind of Christ. And so by these two ways, Jesus' example and the dwelling of a spirit within us, we can be united with other believers for the glory of God. But see, something goes wrong in us so often when we forget to look at Jesus and we begin to look into ourselves for humility. We begin to look and think that somehow we can drum it up. And what we do sometimes when we, believe, when we try to do that is we believe, like my friend Jerry believed, that humility means weakness. And we get this wrong picture in our head. Humility is not weakness at all. There's a certain courage that goes with being humble. It is not weakness. When I look at the life of Christ, the last word that comes to my mind is weak. That is the last thing that comes to my mind. Try walking the way Jesus did. Try denying sin. Try denying yourself. Try being obedient to the Father. Try standing for what's right. And you tell me if Jesus was weak or not. Proverbs 22 says this, Humility is the fear of the Lord. That's a good definition of, of humility. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Humility is not weakness. And because Jesus feared the Lord, because Jesus loved the Lord, he was humble and obedient, listen to what God says about him. Look at verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. You know, this time of year that we're in right now, this is the fall, right? We get these crazy winds, and, and I've heard them called leaf strippers, right? These winds come in, they strip the leaves off the trees. Well, what we're looking at here is because of the fall of man, the winds of affliction came and stripped Jesus of layer after layer of honor. Stripped him of layer after layer of honor until he was left naked, bloodied, broken on a cross and then laid penniless in a borrowed grave. Remember what Jesus said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. No one has ever humbled themselves as much as our Lord, as Jesus Christ. And no one ever has been or ever will be exalted as high as our Lord Jesus Christ has been exalted. And this is the way God has determined for us. This is the way God has laid out for us the life of Jesus. It's not by giving. It's not by getting. It's by giving. It's by giving. It's by being united. It's by being humble towards your brothers and sisters. It's by giving. It's by sacrifice and humility. It's not by using your position as a source of power to gain an advantage over people. That's not it. This is the way Jesus walked, and this is the way that we're to follow him. Our Savior was displayed on a criminal's cross, and darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. How do we stay united with each other as brothers and sisters? We get our example of perfect humility, Jesus Christ. And not only that, we have the mind of Christ. I hope this was a good reminder today. Not to look into yourself to try to be humble, to just tell yourself you can do it. But humble yourself before the Lord. Spend time with the Lord. Think about the Lord. Talk to the Lord. And he'll help us to be united as a church and stand against the persecution coming from without, conflicts from within, and false teachings. Can you pray with me? Lord, I take a passage like this and I feel like I could preach on a week for it, Lord, just looking at you and looking at different aspects of you. Father, I take what, I pray that you will take what I lacked, Lord. You will take it and make it much. Anything that I said that was not right, Lord, I, take, I pray that you would remove it from our minds and pray that you would bless what was spoken, Lord, and give it life and fruit. May it produce fruit in our lives, not just this morning, not just this week, but forever, Lord, as we look to you, as we remember who you are and how humble you were, Lord. We thank you for your cross. We thank you for your obedience to the Lord, to the Father, so that we could be saved. 
In Jesus' name.